Well, welcome to uh, Eastman's Podcast Edition. I'm Ike Eastman, your host, and I have Trevor Thompson with me. And Trevor leads a very interesting life. In fact, I just watched a film that yeah. you were in with Cole. Yes. That was that looked like an epic freaking adventure. We had a uh, we had a hell of a time I, I all can't. together, and it was cool to do something special for a friend of ours. Yeah. So, like, so the guys that haven't seen it, explain what what the what the what the premise was and what you guys did. Yes. Yeah, so what the premise was was. Uh, Jonathan Blank is a double amputee, real close to his hips. So he's missing both legs, very high up. So he has a hard time moving around in rugged terrain. And it was in an IED? Yeah. Uh, he got blown up. Uh, he was a recon Marine. Okay. And we've known him for a long time. He's involved with Black Rifle, and so is Cole. I work there, but I also work for Cole, assistant guiding up in oh, really? Alaska. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And so He's a good man. Yeah, Cole's all right. <laughs> we spend a lot of time in a tent together. <laughs> Big <spoon? laughs> That depends on how cold I am. But uh, Cole thought, and he sort of proposed the idea that it would be really cool to put a group of black rifle guys in um, to draw for Mountain Goat on yeah. Kodiak and have Jonathan as one of them. Well, it ended up where only two guys drew, and Jonathan and another guy. And so we're like, hey, let's let's figure out a way that we can just get John up there on a goat. And so Cole did most of the legwork on figuring out how to make a pack frame system. And we carried John, we, Cole, carried Cole. John the whole time. Jeez. And then we split up Cole and John's gear amongst us and carried it all the way up that mountain. So you guys are you're, you're pushing 150 probably, 150 On the pounds. way out, yeah. Um, it was probably over 100 on the way in, God, somewhere man. in there. And, uh, Which is the hard part because that's up. Yeah, I mean we had to go up to get out too, because <laughs> we went up and over. That sounds like my dad's story. We walked uphill both ways in a snowstorm. It's possible if you're <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. So you got a goat. Yeah. Got a, I, yeah. That actually, that's a really heavy goat. John shot a fantastic goat. Yes. Um. Shit, I think it was like an eight year old or something like. Yeah. He's a big goat. And. It, and uh, it had just happened because you guys didn't know they were there. We didn't know those two billy goats were there. So we we were looking at another group over the hill. We couldn't really get a good shot on them, um, on a goat that we wanted. And it was the first day of the hunt. We're like, let's just relax. We'll see if they come closer. They're, you know, one of the billies in that group might roll up the hill. Right. It, patience is always yep. the thing that will pay off in a hunt. Yeah, absolutely. And so we were so patient that – we didn't even know goats were there and they wrapped around the mountain and, <laughs> and John literally looks up the hill at me and Cole and Cole and I are doing what guides do, which is like looking at the animals that we're trying to figure out. And he's like, hey, I, I, I. I'm like, what? what? Be quiet. Like, <laughs> Quit moving. Oh, oh, there's goats over there. <laughs> Cole's like, get down there. Like, go range that for them. So I got down there and, and ranged and we got him set up and John made a good shot. It was like 330 ish. Oh, nice. Um, made a decent shot and then made a, incredible follow-up yeah yeah and hammered that thing those things are so <clears throat> dense when i shot mine i yeah. was absolutely shocked how dense they are well, when you tell people like oh yeah really big goats 300 pounds they're like no way yeah oh yeah y yes way yeah they're huge yeah yeah and when you get up on they're a not big very line, wide but they are dense yeah yeah they're about yeah wide about that tall yeah yeah that's a big animal that's very cool so appreciate you guys doing that by the hey way. that's uh, awesome it's a great story and it was super cool and that's a place that John will never, maybe never get to go again. Right. And never get to do a hunt like that again. And, I mean, I don't care how hard that was. Like, yeah. we were going to make that happen. Yeah. That's awesome. So, where'd you grow up, Trevor? Los Angeles. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, for reals. So, the Orange County, like, the whole nine? Yeah, a little north of there, but, yeah, kind of, like, just inland from Malibu, uh, Ventura County, north side of L.A. County. So, did you grow up in the outer doors? Did you, were you surfing? A little bit of surfing. Uh, some skateboarding. You know, bike riding, that kind of stuff. I was a track and field guy. So, yeah, I was outside okay. all the time. Um, but both my parents are from L.A. Wow. Like, born and raised there. Uh, my grandparents have lived there since the 40s. Whole back when it was real yep. neat. Oh, yeah. <coughs> back, um, when, back when California was really a cool place. Yeah, it was. And, I mean, even my mom, where, where I ended up growing up, she grew up in the same area. And they used to ride horses around. And, like, it's changed a lot. Where? Where's the uh, little Agora town? Hills. Oh, Westlake Village, yeah. Okay. It, all, almost all that whole area used to be owned by like Bob Hope. It was oh, like, it was yeah. all ranch land yes. and like orange yes. groves, and yep. it's changed a significant amount even since I've moved away. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So you grew up high school and college. Did you, did I did college? one year of art school, 
<laughs> I went to uh, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So in, you're in really artistic. I'm really weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I went to school in Chicago. That was 2006. Really didn't feel like I was getting a lot done um, personally. Uh-huh. My family has had somebody serve in every conflict back through the French and Indian War type of thing. Oh, my gosh. Both sides of the Civil War, everything. Wow. Um, yeah. And I thought maybe maybe this is my time to do something. And so I enlisted in the Navy and went to the SEAL teams for nine years. Oh, my gosh. Uh-huh. That. So I, I asked Mike Glover this the other day. Uh-huh. I said, okay, what's the worst one? Of and what? Could, the worst is it harder to be to go? I can't remember the names. You have to. Oh, all the trainings. Yeah, all the trainings. Yeah. Which is what's the worst? And he goes, buds, oh, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. He goes, yeah. when you add water to all that, it's a complete game changer. Water's a great equalizer. Yes. Um, all of a sudden, everybody doesn't want to drown. Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. It's weird how everybody just doesn't want to be cold. <laughs> Constantly. Uh yeah, every day. Yeah, that's crazy. So, Navy, what'd you do in for nine years? Yep. What'd you do with them? So I did three deployments. Uh, I spent some time in Afghanistan. Uh, I got, I actually spent my last two, just over two years on the parachute team. So if you've seen the guys jump into, yeah. I don't know, like uh, MLB all-star games, the X games, F1 races, yeah. uh, football games. Like I did that for a couple of years. Oh, that'd uh, be so fun. Yeah, it was super fun. So you, um, so, you, so you like jumping out of airplanes? Yeah, I mean a little bit. <laughs> oh, jeez. I always tell people, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? You have not been on those airplanes. I have not. <laughs> You're right. Some of those are held together by duct tape. <laughs> hey, it's leaking back here. It's, <laughs> it's supposed to do that. Let me know if it's not leaking. That's when exactly. we're in trouble. <laughs> I heard that on a 53 once on a helicopter. I'm like, this thing is pouring hydraulic fluid. The guy goes, tell me when it's not. That's the bad news. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks. I didn't want to hear any of this. I can't even sleep in this thing. It's too loud. That's awesome. So got out of, got out of uh, SEAL teams mm-hmm. and working for Black Rifle. Yeah. Uh, I had like a a gap of about a year when I did a bunch of base jumping and skydiving and traveled around a bit. Um, didn't really have a job, you know, in, like a salaried position right. anywhere. Right. Andy Stump and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, he invited me on a bear hunt. Okay. John Dudley taught me how to shoot a bow. Um, so man, sometimes it's really lucky and fortunate circumstances that get you into something. Yeah. So I owe it to both those guys for getting me into bow hunting and I got to go. So your first animal was a bear. Black bear, yeah. Now, how was that? Was With fantastic. a bow. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah. I have a guy who works for me, Brandon. He uh, killed his first black bear with a bow last year, and he's like, I'm addicted to the roar. Oh, man. You know, when they when you whack them with a bow well, and, and they turn and this, around. This one didn't do that because I shot it at about 18 yards, yeah. 18 or 20 yards, and uh, Zipped right through hammered it. it right in the heart. And oh. it, just, it just sort of like spun around and rolled over, and it was smoked. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just happy that, man, I made a great a really great execution on the shot. What state was that? Uh, it was actually in British Columbia. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, it was a big got, bear. They got a ton of those up there. Oh, yeah. They're everywhere. <laughs> so that was your first, uh, first how, animal. How long ago was that? What was that? About about six years ago. Really? Mm-hmm. So you've hunted. Have you killed an elk yet? I've killed three, four. Four. <laughs> two oh. bulls and two cows. All right. So it's, it's safe to say you're addicted to it. Oh, yeah. I think I've killed... Uh, maybe three or four dozen animals in the last six years. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I'm after it. What? So you're shooting a PSE? You're nope. Um, so I have, I have Matthews and a Hoyt. I'm not really tied to anybody in particular. Yeah. Um, I've shot some of the PSEs, but right now I'm currently addicted to my longbow. Oh, you're a traditional guy now. Yeah. Well, I shot an axis deer on Maui with it. Uh-huh. And then I, sh- then I shot an elk last year with it. And at this point, I'm like, well, if I can make it happen on those things, let's rock and roll. Yep. Yep. You know? You've hit some hard ones. Mm-hmm. And now, now let's shoot something bigger like an elk with it. Like a, like a big bull elk. Yes. And I shot a cow. Um, that, was, cool. that was great. So but, is it custom built or what? what? Uh, it's like a semi-custom okay. from Centaur. Were they, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. They fit it for you. Yeah. So I bought it used. Okay. Um, on the recommendation uh from a guy and he's like yeah i think you'll like this you know based on what you're telling me about how you like to shoot i got it and i was immediately like oh man this is great it's funny people don't realize that the traditional bows they're they're like shoes they are every one of them fits and shoots different yeah. and you got to find the one that fits you and you shoot well yeah not i mean it, i can't pick your bow up and shoot no. it probably and what 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 got me into it was um i had south cox build me one yeah I know South. He used to be an editor. Yeah, he's fantastic. And so I told him, hey, man, go wild. And he's like, yeah, that's dumb. Um, 
send me some pictures yeah. of bows you like, and then I'll then I'll pick something. Right. So he did that, um, and built me a bow, and I loved it. I'm like, but man, I, you know, those like I want to try a longbow, and talk to a few people, and they're like, well, based on what you're talking about and how you like to hunt, and like what kind of person you are, like this might fit you. And I have a really long draw length, anyways. Oh, do you? Yeah. You, so you don't look like you do. You'd be surprised. So no. I'm I'm a thirty and a half on a compound. You're kidding me. Nope. You're a freaking ape. Yep. And so on a longbow, I draw like a twenty nine. Because you're not tall, are you? Nope. Five nine. And you got a thirty inch draw mm-hmm. length. My brother's six three and he's got a thirty. I and am a, half a inch. monkey. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. So I can shoot like six hundred and sixty grain, you know, trad arrows. Jim Sprites didn't get you into boxing in the navy. <laughs> well, I, I boxed a little bit as a kid. Yeah. That's that's that's. That's good. That's a good quality in a boxer. Oh, Long a monkey. Arms. That's very cool. So, kids, family, married? Nope. Just enjoying yeah. life. Yeah. How old are you? I am 35 as of uh, two weeks ago. Oh, yeah, very January cool. January 10th. So, you're uh, trad bowing, or, and, well, actually, technically long bowing now. Yeah. Long bowing. Um, so, what's so what's the, the reason, you know, you're in the field, you've been doing this for six years. What What's the reason you hunt? What Why? Why? What's attracting, you know, for you and then what keeps you hunting? This episode is brought to you by Leupold Optics. Now, Leupold is a family owned company and has been for a really long time. Generations, I believe they're in their fifth generation of ownership. I sat down with Bruce Pettit, the CEO of Leupold recently, and we talked about what they call the Punisher. That is how they punish their scope. So check out that episode. Also check out Lilpold.com. They have new range finding binos. They have awesome sunglasses. They have unbelievable rifle scopes and they're American made. Check them out, Lilpold.com. So I'm super into fitness. Um, that's been a, a big thing in my entire life. Both my parents were like collegiate level athletes. Wow. Uh, my, my brother, what one of my brothers was. And coming from the SEAL teams, I always was tuned into it. And so I also got into the ethics of how to eat. Uh. And so <laughs> right before I started hunting, I was like, man, I, I just cannot be involved in factory farming anymore. And by factory farming, I mean factory farming. I don't mean like a rancher that you go and buy half a cow from. Right. That's you're, di- you're that's, talking that's about a different cows process. sitting in a yep. lot somewhere. Yep, in a feed lot. Yeah. And that's all they do. And they never move. Or chickens that are in boxes, essentially. Yeah. I didn't want to be part of that. That's my personal choice. Right. Right. You're like, cool, I'm going to. I'm going to try some other ways to eat. And none of those worked. <laughs> you know, like I tried the vegetarian thing. I'm like, just to, as like a, as like a gap filler. Like, right. I, I got to figure out a way to get like farm food. Well, in between, I'm just not going to eat this thing. I'm like, well, that's stupid. I feel like crap. <laughs> and so I very feel like crap. I yeah, look like crap. Exactly. And so very luckily I immediately started hunting and started filling my freezers. And I've been fortunate in the drive to get animals every year because I eat almost nothing but game meat. Yeah. Unless you're at a restaurant and yep. they don't serve it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you, you're a, a fanatic on food. Yep. What, tell me something that I should, that everybody should know about food besides obviously the organic wild game is, I mean, you can't beat that. Well, the less ingredients you have, the better, but the more varied your types of food, really, the better your diet's going to be for it. Right. So, most most Americans uh, and most Western people eat like a hundred different food items at, at a maximum. You know, yeah. they're, they're usually hovering in like the fifty to seventy. If you go to a hunter gatherer or say you go to Venezuela, yeah, eh, out in a village out there, they might eat a thousand different kinds of food. You're kidding me. Yeah, from, because they're eating from plant whatever's items, option. fruits. Yep, and Whatever. what whatever's in season. Season, yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. You know, so if you can vary your protein intake, say, like at my house right now, I have. Moose, elk, blacktail, cod, uh, salmon, halibut, pronghorn, right? So do you think it has to be red meat variants? Everything. Or, or does it need to be different types of All colors? the things. Really? Yep. So from from fowl to fish for red meat, white meat, uh, vegetables, fruits, whatever it is. So that's why when – so I find myself and in, in, in recently I've been I, – I had a horrible accident with my knee – a couple years ago and I've been struggling with it until just recently. Yeah. Which changes fitness. I mean, changes how you look at stuff too. Oh. So I'm the fattest I've ever been. However, but I, I'm just looking at myself and go, you know what? I bet 
that that makes sense because I eat the same thing constantly. Uh huh. I eat a banana for breakfast. I eat a sandwich for lunch. The same thing. So that's not healthy. It is healthy, but there is a healthier way to do it. Really? Right. There's a better way for your gut to respond, and the more different kinds of food items you get, the different bioavailability of different minerals and nutrients that are going to be in them. You know, uh, for instance, like there's a warning: don't eat more than a whole moose liver in a year <laughs> because they eat a lot of cadmium. Oh. A, a lot of stuff with cadmium in it. Okay. So that heavy metal get in your system. Yeah. Okay. So there, that's like a good news, bad news type of thing. So that shows you, okay, that animal has a lot of this thing in it. So that means it probably has some of this stuff and this stuff. And, you know, like axis meat is the most nutrient dense red meat from an ungulate. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that will give you a specific response to your, to your system. Huh. That's really interesting. So, okay, so meats, vegetables the same way? You got to yeah, change up. Yeah, I mostly, j- I don't really eat you look, I a ton of veggies. You don't? No, like squash and sweet potatoes and parsnips. That's about it. <laughs> wow. Okay, so fruits, do you eat a lot of fruit? Not really. A little bit of fruit. Maybe mostly some, protein. Maybe some oranges and apples. Mostly proteins. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of on the like paleo-ish if people want to label it something. Yeah. Uh, mostly cooking butter. Oh, I render all my own elk and bear fat, so I cook in those too. Yeah. Uh, lards and tallows. I, I did paleo. I, I didn't, well, I did paleo once. Mm-hmm. It that can be hard if you're super strict, right? It's You're trying to make a lifestyle choice. Yeah, and that's that's what I noticed. I was really strict for 30 days, and I was like, I'm just going to do it on 30 days. Yeah, Felt made it really into amazing. a religion. Yeah, in the second good. 30 days? Crushed you. Yeah. yeah because so I didn't, I should have. Dumb me. I read. I read the first half of the yep. book, not the second half. Perfect. That says start bringing stuff back in slowly. I'm like, <laughs> ah, tomorrow I'm done. I'm gonna pizza. Have, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, crushed me absolutely. Yeah. In fact, but it was good because I found out some certain things. Like I can't eat dairy. Like, yep. See, there you go. Processed dairy. I couldn't. I didn't know I was allergic to that. Well, I, and every human is lightly allergic to lactose. Yeah, that D- makes it, sense. It doesn't matter what you think. We all are to a degree. Yeah. Some people, it's so little it doesn't even matter. Yeah. The other thing I found out is gluten, you know, beer. I, screws with you. Oh, man. Yeah. I couldn't do beer anymore. Yeah, I can do one. Yeah. I can have a beer. Yep. I can't do anything else. Yep. Two, two beers, Screwed. a mess. Yep. If two beers, I might as well have a case, mm-hmm. which that's not ideal either. No. That's very cool. That's that's good knowledge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of that. Yeah. So uh, what is, what's one of the things that, um, that keeps you hunting? Mm-hmm. Now that we know why you hunt, what keeps you hunting? The people, the experiences, and kind of touching what humans have done genetically for so long. Um, so I get to guide with Cole Kramer. Yeah. And so I'm up there spring and fall. So you do bear hunts too? Mm-hmm. Oh, awesome. Bear, goat, deer. And being able to experience some of those things and being out in the field and just, I don't know, being a sled dog. Yeah doing the hard thing and putting my head down and all I have to do is concentrate on what's right in front of me. That keeps me hunting all year. Yeah. You know, and, and understanding that it's a process that's doing me better, whether or not there's a connection on the other end with an animal. So you just, you're like in the, you just being out there, the, uh-huh. so, the solidarity of it, yep. the whole nine yards. Oh yeah. I mean, like I shot a, I shot a big bull two years ago. Which state? Uh, here in Utah. Okay. He's like 330, 340. Nice. And then I shot a 3x3 three three in Idaho two weeks later. Nice. In a wilderness area. Well, that 3x3 three three meant more to me than yeah. the big bull. It was a lot more work. I had a ton more work. Yeah. And yeah. it was the only bull we saw for a week and a half. Isn't that crazy how how our mind psyche works that way? Yeah. That we, t- we, we reference, like you just did it, you referenced an elk by its size. Yep. But, you, it, but what really is, is it's the experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday with a guy. He's like, he wanted, oh, I want to shoot a, I don't, money's no object. I want to shoot a 200-inch mule deer. Yeah. I said, okay, what kind of experience do you want? Yeah. He goes, oh, no, I, I want a really good experience. I said, well, that's not going to be easy. Precisely. Otherwise, everybody would do it. You can't have both. No. Necessarily. If you want to go to Mexico and shoot a 200-inch deer, you can go to Mexico and shoot a 200-inch mule deer. If you no. got money, you can shoot and name the name the size. Yeah, exactly. Unless you're looking at world records, you can name the size. Yeah. But if you want an experience like you did with a 3 by 4 uh-huh. you're not going to hit a 200-inch mule deer on, behind every Absolutely tree. Absolutely not. No That's way. how it works. Like I, I saw that thing and had maybe 20 seconds to shoot it. Oof. Were you shooting a wheel bow then? Nope. That was a rifle. 
Oh, okay. I had my recurve in my hand and my rifle, and I'm like, if something steps out in front of me, they're getting shot with a bow, <laughs> and if they're it's way out there, I'm shooting it anyways. <laughs> it's a wilderness area, and I may never see one again. Yeah. What yeah. what rifle are you shooting? That uh, was a 28 nozzler. Who, who makes it? That was a nozzler. Oh, was it actually yeah, a nozzler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Very cool. So keep hunting, solidarity. Um, what is one of the things that, that you, we kind of talked about one of the things, but what is one of the things that our audience, that my audience can go, oh, I learned this from Trevor and it, it, and it really is impactful. What is one thing that you're really passionate about? Um, so I have it written on a whiteboard that I write my workouts on and I talk about it on a regular basis and it's be an asset, be not, an asset. not a liability. So maybe that means showing up to a hunt as fit as you can be. Yeah. Maybe that means practicing with your bow, your rifle, the slingshot that you're going to use for that hunt as much as possible so that when you show up there, you've done all the work that you could possibly do. You need to be an asset when you're there. You don't need to be the person getting your hand held and walked through the experience. That's how I feel about it. And you can take that down to the lowest possible level. To any. To everything. To your freaking house. Be an asset in your house. Keep it keep it straightened up. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really impactful. Be an asset. Don't be a liability. Don't yeah. be something that somebody has to take care of. Yep. Be the person that's doing the taking care of. Yeah. And take care of your own stuff. Exactly. Keep your house in shape. Yeah. And if you can keep your 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 house, uh, whether that means holistically you or the physical, you know, presence. Yeah. In shape, everything else falls into place. So I I, <laughs> I I think I learned this from a naval admiral who did a speech once, but he said, "Make your bed." Mm-hmm every morning and my kids to this day they'll they'll say i did i already accomplished something dad yeah i made my bed and it's for real yeah and you, you start your day that way and you be an asset the rest of the day you're gonna live a full a very full life i mean i do that i make the bed yeah it's, it's not that hard no i take, even do it in a hotel room i yeah. think people think i'm crazy yeah. take make, eight seconds yeah because <laughs> it sets that kind of stuff sets the tone for the rest of your day yes. and then that that sets the habit for the rest of your week and the rest of your month and the rest of your year well you know what else i found um, and I didn't recognize this in myself. I recognized this in my kids when I was teaching them that when you come home and you go to bed and your bed's a mess, mm-hmm. that's a horrible way to end your day. Yes, it is. It's, it's just saying I didn't do anything all day. I'm not worth that. Yes, exactly. That's very cool. All right. Last question. This is a big one. Uh, what are you going to be thinking about on your deathbed? If, if God, for, you know, God willing, you have the opportunity to do that. Hopefully I'll be thinking that I got to do and took the chance at doing everything I wanted to do. That's it. I, I'm the kind of person that I want to knock on the door of everything that I have the opportunity to knock on the door for. Like I met Cole at John Barclow's 50th birthday. Okay. And Cole's like, Hey man, I heard you just started hunting and you, you have the background in the SEAL teams and you know Barclow. So, you know, you're kind of a trusted You've entity. You've been vetted. Do you want to come up and pack on a, on a hunt? You know, maybe try it out and see how you feel about it. I said yes immediately. Cause that's an opportunity. Yeah. I'm not going to say no, you know, like my buddy moved to Oregon and he says, Hey, you want to come hunt Roosevelt elk? I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah, absolutely. I have no idea what, what it's about. Let's rock and roll because whether or not I'm successful or I hate it, at least I gave it a shot. Yeah. Do you find stuff that you hate? Uh, yeah. Is Apparently vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> vegetables in a lot of food. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's fun. Yeah. And, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate the time. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us who you are and what you did. Of course. What uh, last cra- And I did this with a couple of people. Last craziest story that you've been involved in? Pick a subject. Um, let's, do the, <laughs> let's, let's do while, while you're in, in service. Okay. Um, so that's one that I've told before. That's okay. No, I'm saying people might have heard it. Uh, so... In the SEAL teams, you or before you get in the SEAL teams, you learn how to skydive. It's part of the process. Okay. And it's like a 25 jump process, uh, which the first seven jumps are pretty standard. And then after that, they start doing military stuff. You're in rocks and all sorts of stuff all over you. Well, on the 24th jump, we were doing our graduation jump. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing a 65 pound backpack on my front. Yeah. A weapon strapped to my side. O2 tank strapped to the other side. Oxygen masks. We're jumping from like 14,000 feet, so simulating very high altitude. It's at night. I'm uh, like 20 years old, brand new to skydiving. We jump out. 
Everything seems like it's going well. I wave off. I pull the ripcord, and my pilot chute wrapped around the little parachute, pulls the big one out, oh, wraps around my right arm. I'm like, <coughs> holds it up in the air. No, for real. Yeah. It's at night, and I'm like, oh, this is how I die. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to cut that away and pull your reserve. Thank well, I God could, you're at 14,000 feet. Yeah, well, no, this was at like 6,000 feet oh, when you geez. pull. Oh, jeez. So now I'm, I'm still falling, and I, I can't get to my cutaway handle with my right arm because it's stuck, stuck in the air. Right. Yep. Yeah. And the bag that the main parachute is in is now coming undone, and there's lines flying around, and I can't find the cutaway with my left hand. I'm wearing gloves. It's in January. I'm starting to have a little bit of anxiety. There's some spicy words flying around. <laughs> and... Uh, Spicy words. Real spicy. Thoughts. Real <laughs> spicy. A lot of cursing happening, and uh, I'm flipping out, and uh, I can't get to the cutaway. I'm like, this is how I die. I can't get it. You know, I keep reaching. I grab a hose. I grab a, a something else, a piece of the parachute. Like, nothing's coming out. Oh, my gosh. Well, the real problem there is now there's lines flying all over the place, and if my reserve hits those lines, it'll tangle in those, mm-hmm. and, I'll, and I'll die. Yeah. I know that. I'm thinking that. That's right. my only thought because yeah. I'm not. Very myopic at that point. I have one thought, and it's don't die. <laughs> Fix this shit. You're going to die. <laughs> Fix this shit before that ground right there comes in. Yep, closer. and it's coming. Every second, it's getting closer. 120 miles an hour. Yeah, and I had blanked out the reality that there's a uh, so there's an automatic activation device in the parachute that'll open the reserve in a case like this. Usually, it means somebody's blacked out or oh, really? knocked out at like, I don't know, 1,500 or 2,000 feet or something. It does it automatically. It does it automatically. For pressure. Yeah. Pressure and speed. Okay. And it did it. And uh, blind luck, it went through all those lines and opened up clean up above my head. You're kidding me. And the lines are wrapped around the lines for the reserve, and it looked like an hourglass above my head. I'm like, oh, man, I lived. Holy shit. Now, how am I going to navigate this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all stuck (laughs) together. And I looked around. I looked behind me. I could sort of see the drop zone behind me somewhere. And I tried to turn the parachute. It sort of crept around to the left. And then I had drifted over a hill that was next to the drop zone. Oh, no. And I hit the hill, rolled down the hill, landed like Wiley Coyote on a road. <laughs> Smack. Yep. Wham. Legs are out. I'm like, oh, man. Pulled the parachute to my feet. Kind of did the fingers and toes game. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, yeah. There's no tingling. I think I'm alive. Yeah. And then a car almost hit me coming oh. out of the corner. <laughs> This is no joke. This is like you couldn't have written a script. This is literally Wiley Coyote. Yes. Yeah, so I finally get all my stuff squared away, and I called on the radio, and I'm like, yeah, I'm on the ground. This is jumper number whatever. I was 26 or something. Yeah. And they had me repeat it. Like, that's not possible. Because another group had jumped in front of us, and I landed before them. Well, because you you didn't deploy until 2000. I took the fast way to the ground. (laughs) took the elevator. Um, Yeah. And the worst injury I had was like a twisted ankle and some rope burn. Wow. Blind luck. Yeah, and then, you know, seven, eight years later, I ended up on the jump team. <laughs> They're like, hey, he's probably not going to die. We put him through it. He already did that once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. He's lucky. He's like a cat. It's fine. So how much do you jump now? I still jump quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I have Were you like on the jump with, with the Black Rifle team? With Recently? Yeah. No, I didn't do the, that. The nope. Arctic or nope. the Seven Continents? No, that was uh, Logan Stark and Jericho Denman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have about 6,500 skydives now. Jeez. Yeah, getting towards about 900 base jumps. Oh, my gosh. Base jumps? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so are you going to ever get one of those flying suits? I do it all the time. Do you did, really? did it last September a bunch. Do you, can you do that in Utah? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. That... Those things, I watch those on, on like social media. That is just absolutely enthralling. I'll show you some stuff when we're done. Yes. Good. So if I was to get into <laughs> skydiving, how do you do that? So I'm a tandem instructor. Um, we just put you on the front of me. Really? That's how we'd start. Uh, I haven't got so the everybody goal. Everybody listening, to that's what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be hugging me. Yeah. It's the best thing you can do, strap to a man. <laughs> with your pants. <laughs> Back to cuddling with Cole. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which we took Cole on a skydive. Did you really? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, the thing that scares me is I love to fly. I'm a pilot. I love oh, flying. Cool. I mean, that's that's what I do. But I've just never had the, the urge to go, yeah, let's just see what happens. Let's just leave. Yeah. No, thanks. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. It's fun. <laughs> you should do it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, Man, thanks a lot. It's awesome. Appreciate it. Now I now I get to see skydives and, and, and what do they call, what do they call that wingsuit base jumping wingsuit. Mm. 
wingsuit base jumping. You look like a flying squirrel. A little bit. That's awesome. It's like a like a mattress. So how how high do you have to get to do that? I mean, there's got to be. Well, to do it more than once. Um. <laughs> Usually with wingsuiting, it's a couple thousand feet. Is it? Um, not underneath you, but total length of flight. Okay. Um, so you'll jump from a, a tall peak, and you want between 500 and 700 feet directly Direct. below you, and then you can fly out. And I've done jumps that have three to 5,000 feet of total elevation loss from exit to landing. So it's minutes. It can be up to two minutes, yeah, wow. easily. Wow. You can never go to, like, Europe where they... That's where I was last time, in the really? Dolomites. Yep. In, is... in Italy. That is so crazy. It's fantastic. Great people, great food, great jumps. <laughs> that, I, that is a whole nother. I'm gonna. I'm not only gonna jump out of this airplane. I'm gonna jump out and hope this suit flies. Oh yeah, a lot of hoping and praying. <laughs> well, I appreciate it coming on. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. I'm uh, honored to meet you. Thanks for your service. You too. Thanks Thank for you. everything you're doing. And uh, keep it up. Keep calling line up there. I the, try to. In the Alaskan wilderness. It's the wilderness. It is. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You got to hang out with some of the people that I think are most the most interesting I've ever met. And remember, fair chase is the only way to hunt and take trophy big game. See you next time right here on Eastman's Podcast Edition.